Hello, this is Pro Longevity, the podcast. This is our first episode. Very excited about this. I'm Susan Flory. I'm going to be your co host. Hello, Graham. Hi, Susan, and I'm Graham Phillips, the pharmacist who gave up drugs and founder of the Pro Longevity Project. We provide precision nutrition. Uh, we provide uh, continual blood glucose monitoring. And having spent all those years spooning more and more medication into people, I now find my, I can do much better with a dietary intervention and people having less and less medication. On with the show. And talk about much better. I mean, you have had such impressive success. I mean, it's off the charts. So much so, you know, putting people on a better cardio metabolic footing, so much so that you've got national recognition. I do want to let everyone know about your recent award. Well, um, blush. Um, yeah, thank you, Susan. As you know, my group of pharmacies won pretty much all the national awards and most of them twice. But when we put Pro Longevity up for a big award, I wasn't quite sure whether it would qualify. It was a chem chemist and druggist award. Chemist and druggist is a 150 year old uh, magazine. It's one of the most prestigious awards that you can win. And we won it for innovation. So I'm absolutely over the moon about it, actually. And sneak preview, we're up for another big award tonight. So fingers crossed for that one, too. Oh, how timely. Well, we'll have to, we'll be able to put that all in the intro because of course you're going to win it. We know this. Now, <laughs> I also want to say that you have performed well above expectations as my health and longevity correspondent on the big middle. I can't thank you enough for that. We've done what, three episodes now? Yeah. And Susan, I've been so honored to, to you know, have an opportunity to speak. The first episode, as you know, was um, a bit self-indulgent. It was quite a lot about me. But the second two episodes in particular, concentrating on the role of diet, nutrition and sleep in cardiometabolic health and how that affects your COVID risk and all that related to the microbiome, which is another episode. Yeah, it's been great. And I know it's created a lot of attention. So, you know, thank you, Susan, so much for the opportunity. Well, we need to get that story, the secondary pandemic that's running alongside this one. I learned a new word just this morning reading Richard Horton's op-ed recent piece, it's really a syndemic, isn't it? S-Y-N. You guys probably know about that, but I don't. But anyway, we're, we're focusing on, you know, the cardiometabolic plague that's running alongside and under and over this one. And, you know, we know that it's the root cause of, of the worst COVID outcomes. So in this podcast, Pro Longevity, we are going to be speaking with a range of experts as we go, probably every couple of weeks. And we'll be delving into all that you do, Graham, at Pro Longevity with your team. You're building up quite a nice business there. Uh, client stories, we'll be getting scientific insights. And, uh, you know, it's it's all in keeping with what we know is the nouvelle vague of lifestyle disease treatment, precision, indi individualized approaches. And this is for, for the individual and for public health. Ab absolutely. I mean, if you read the um the, the media, you would assume that you know the only game in town is injections um, and uh, drugs for COVID. And what doesn't get discussed is our basic cardiometabolic health and the root causes around nutrition, sleep, exercise, and that's where we come in. Well, let us get on with our first show, the Pro Longevity Podcast. I am so excited about our first guest. Uh, we're out of the gate with a legend, uh, sports scientist extraordinaire, Prof. Tim Noakes. Welcome, Prof Noakes. Hi, Susan and Graham. Thank you very much. That's very kind of you. And again, Graham, congratulations on your recent award. Uh, well, that's you, wonderful. Tim. Well deserved. Fantastic. I, uh over the moon to have you sort of look, help us launch our podcast. Um, as, as you know, I, we haven't actually physically met, but I feel like we're old buddies. I followed your Twitters and your Twitter storms. Um, and I followed your presentations, particularly one to the Public Health Collaboration. As you know, I'm passionate about that organization and I'm, I'm ambassador for it. So, you know, a million times, thank you for joining us. And we are just delighted. And can I say honored to have you amongst us? You guys doing such amazing work at the front line, and it's a privilege to be with you. I, I just want to say, um, for those 
For those few, there may be just a couple out there in the universe who don't know about you, Prof Noakes. Could we start at 2010 when you had your epiphany and you can just give us sort of, you know, uh, a potted no. history of how you became so active and so renowned. I mean, I was looking at one of your Twitter, one of your tweets the other day and somebody said, he is a world resource, which, you know, we heartily agree with. <laughs> a lot of people say other things about my tweets. <laughs> my <dad. laughs> so, so 2010, uh, so it, it starts that for 30 years, I'd been fighting the industry that was overselling sports drinks to athletes. And I'd been part of the problem because I'd promoted this high carbohydrate diet. Now, during this period, my dad dies of type 2 diabetes, and I'm a medically trained doctor, and I can't help him. I watch as he dies, and it's the worst you can possibly have, and I think everyone needs to understand that. You know, having diabetes is not, it's, it's going out, to, the outcome is going to be bad, and you have to understand that. You must do something about it. You can't just pretend it's going to be fine, because it won't be, and you lose your legs and your kidneys and everything else. So I watched my dad die like this, and it never occurred to me that I was also at risk. However, going back on my own data, I see that I'm profoundly insulin resistant. And already in when I was 28, we did some tests for other reasons, and I was profoundly insulin resistant, even though I was running marathons and training 100 kilometers a week at least. I, I had a level of insulin resistance that uh, is pretty unmatched. I mean, it was horrendous. But of course, at the time, no one worried. Oh, you've got a high fasting insulin. So, so what? You know, oh, you've got a high fasting insulin the whole day. Well, so what? Doesn't no pretty one really much, understood it? Pretty much situation normal, yes. Exactly. So, so anyway, on the night that I finished this book about this 30 year struggle I'd had to convince the world that they didn't need to drink sports drinks to excess because you could die from that, from the condition we described exercise associated hyponatremia. So it took 30 years to prove it. And I sent the manuscript off uh, the one evening. And the next morning, I woke up and, and I, my brain had said to me that you must get up and you must go and run and you mustn't stop running for the rest of your life. Because I'd been writing this book and I hadn't been running enough. So I had this terrible run. And I came home and I said, I'm overweight. I know that you've, to you've got to exercise more to lose weight, but I can't exercise more. I'm old and decrepit and so on. <laughs> And by chance, a book appear, an advert for a book appeared in my email, in my inbox. And that doesn't happen anymore, but it happened then. And it was the book, The New Atkins for the New You, written by Westman, Volick, and Finney. And I looked at it and it said, lose six pounds in six weeks without hunger. And I said, that's fraudulent. I know that to lose weight, you have to be hungry. How can these good scientists, and I knew they were good scientists because I'd followed their work. I was so angry. I absolutely was enraged because <laughs> I said they've sold out to Atkins, calling it the new Atkins for the new you. So I went down to the bookshop and they had the last copy and I bought it. I brought it home and I was so incensed. I immediately started reading. And after two hours, I said, oh, my gosh, I got it all wrong for 33 years. And I decided for lunch, no more carbs. That's it. I'm going to move on to a high protein, high fat diet. I must tell you that my parents are from Liverpool and my mother was involved, mother's family was involved in the meat industry. So I'd been raised on lots of meat. My mother always said meat is very important and fish is very important. And she'd always made sure that I got lots of meat. But when I went to medical school, I became clever and I knew better. <laughs> and I knew that grains and cereals and grains were what you needed to eat. So I started eating them. I got fat. My running went worse, got very poor. And I got type 2 diabetes. So that was my story. In time, I didn't, it, I, I'm not a person who, who likes that bad news. So I waited to see, could I correct my high fasting glucose on the low carb diet? It didn't get it down within range. So eventually I had to take medication and admit that I had type 2 diabetes. But I'm glad to say I'm now in remission. I still take some metformin, but my glucose control is it's, it's exceptional for someone of my age. So I'm I'm very happy and I should be dead. That, that's the point. My dad had the diagnosis and 10 years later he was dead. And I've had the diagnosis of diabetes for at least 10 years. So I should be dead and cross fingers, I don't have any 
overt evidence that I've got type 2 diabetes. Tim, can I ask you, um, because l like me, you were steeped in the orthodoxy, you believed in the orthodoxy, you followed the orthodoxy, the orthodoxy didn't work. All these years of believing in the orthodoxy, one book converts you, and I've just read that book as it happens. Yeah. Um, what was it that triggered you? Because the obvious thing to do, because of cognitive dissonance, was to say, this has to be crap, because I know the science. Why am I going to, after 30 years, suddenly reverse myself? Which is an incredibly brave thing to do, actually. You know, Graham, I've always been interested in anecdotes and observations of, in, of things that don't make sense. To me, that was, and, I'm, and man, my whole career was based on finding evidence for something that didn't look right. And for example, the very first thing I ever studied when I just started doing my PhD was the, the, the so-called Basler hypothesis. And Dr. Basler was a pathologist in California. And he said, because there have been no deaths in marathon runners from heart disease, marathon running must immunize you against coronary artery disease. But I, we knew, because I was interested in marathon running and I was a marathon runner, deaths occurring. So we started collecting those hearts and eventually we were able to prove that this was a ridiculous statement. Mm. So I, I was always looking for the, the usual in medicine. And so when I read this, I then went into the book and it said there are 150 trials of low carbohydrate diets showing that they're effective. Yeah. And I said, but, but, but why don't I know about them? Yeah. Here I am studying and been lecturing on nutrition and sports nutrition and carbohydrate diets and, and I didn't know about them. And yeah. then I realized that, that it, it just made sense to me because I, I think I was so desperate. I was overweight and I was unhappy with my running. I was in a desperate state and I, I would have tried anything. So you'd kind of reached that end point where the, you, you tried the orthodoxy. It's not like you know, a lot of doctors, I think, assume that their patients are not doing what they say. And so they're not following the advice and it's their fault. Yeah. But, but this, I've had the same experience, right? You know that you're following the advice. You know what the advice is and it's still not working. And it kind of, you reach a certain tipping point to say, maybe the problem is the advice, not the operation of it. Yeah. You know, it's, it's funny because we had actually done studies of high fat diets in athletes it, it's quite and we were steve finney was the first and we in fact were the next and we found benefit so i and then the, in the ultimate irony the world's greatest triathlete a lady called paula newby fraser she was a south african and i'd helped her and she went professional in about 1984 just when steve finney published his paper and she phoned me from california where she was training and she said, Tim, I've read this article by Finney. Do you think I should eat a higher fat diet because I'm doing ultra marathons? And I said, yes, Paula, I think you should. She then went and won, won the Ironman championship eight times and she won Ironman races 28 times and she's considered the greatest triathlete. And she said to me, Tim, that was the most important piece of advice I ever got was to eat a high fat diet. And a low carb diet. I said, I never told you to eat a low carb diet. I told you just to eat a low carb diet. So, so at the time that I was promoting this high carbohydrate diet, in the back of my mind, there was still a possibility that a high fat diet might be beneficial. And then when I saw that information, I thought, here's the information that I've been missing. And, and yet, and subsequent to that, you were the target of a malicious attempt to sideline you as a quack preaching junk science. The minute you grabbed your megaphone and started spreading the news to everyone, and you had, you know, the triathlete, you know, who had had great success, you you won your, well, what was it, four years? Your, four years, that malicious right. prosecution by producing mountains of evidence of the health benefits of this. Uh, has your victory changed things or not enough? Not one iota <laughs> in this country. Not one iota. You know, so what? So now I'm going to boast because Graham's had his chance to boast. He won a <laughs> national award. So, <laughs> so, so I, I'm going red. You can see I'm blushing, fake blushing. So there's recently been an analysis of the most productive scientists in all different disciplines. And this is done with the most uh, integrity and, 
and without bias. And in the sports sciences, I rank the third most cited sports scientist in currently alive. And the two guys above me are older, so eventually I'm going to get to number one because they're going to die. die. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I only say that for this reason, that my university had benefited for 40 years of all the research I'd done, and then they turned their back on me as soon as I spoke about the low-carbohydrate diet. And they mobbed me in the media and tried to publicly humiliate me, in fact, which is exactly what they did. So you had this university, it suddenly it turned its back on me after 40 years of making, having benefited from my science and forever saying I'm a good scientist. And then all of a sudden, I was no longer, I was a, a crank, as you said. Now, once I won the case, and, and we won the case because we just bombed them with information. And the prosecution came up with one scientific paper, one paper, which we think is fraudulent anyway. And that was their whole defense. And so... We, we was reproduced 6,000 pages of documentation and could have done much more if had we had time. And the thing is, your newfound, I mean, yes, you read the Atkins book for two hours and had your epiphany and all that. And then you really dug into the crimes against science that, yeah. that started, you know, 80 years ago. I mean, can you give us, you know, a thumbnail sketch of Ansel Keys and, yeah. and President Eisenhower and, you know, Gerald Raven even of Stanford, who, who maybe did some good, but didn't go far enough. That's right. So, so once, so in the trial, then I wrote the book, The Real Food on Trial, which I happen to have here. Yeah, doesn't see it. And there's a copy right on my bookshelf. And you'll be pleased there's a copy on my bookshelf behind us somewhere. Oh, fantastic. <laughs> so, so Marika's Boris and I, I wrote this book, and Marika did an amazing job because she gave the background and the trial in a way that I could never have done. She was just astonishing. And so I, it's got the science and it's got what happened to me in the mobbing that I went through. And then the evidence that we think is so important. When I finished that, I then went and wrote a lot for CrossFit, the, the health group on their website, and went into great detail because I wanted to understand the two great books in this field, obviously Gary Taubes' book and Nina Teichel's book. And I can see, I think, Nina's book behind you. That as well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And what I wanted to do was to, to go through all the information they'd collected and go look in depth in the science. And I, I, it turned out there were 70 events. There's 70 events that, that have driven this low-fat nonsense, the diet. And, and they're all in those books, but I wanted to go and dig it out because I can't remember it just by reading. I have to go and dig into it. So I've written all that stuff, and hopefully we're going to turn that into a book with David Diamond, who's just who's very activist about anti-statins and anti-cholesterol. He's, he's just brilliantly balanced in his analysis. And he, he knows the literature better than anyone. So, so, so what happens is a guy called John Goffman, by 1950, he has already worked out the diet heart hypothesis and the lipid hypothesis. He's worked out that if you eat fat, you change your lipoproteins. Please understand, he wasn't measuring cholesterol. He was measuring lipoproteins. Because, and at that time, people didn't understand what cholesterol was, but they understood what the lipoproteins were. And he discovered that there were two lipoproteins linked to increased heart attack risk. The one went up if you ate carbohydrates, and the other went up if you ate fat. And the one that went up with carbohydrates was the VLDL, triglyceride or VLDL cholesterol. And he said that is purely driven by carbohydrates. And he showed that if you reduce your carbohydrate, it went down. In contrast, the, the, the LDL cholesterol went up in people who ate more fat in the diet. So that he was then the hypothesis. And then he measured VLDL and and LDL in people with heart disease. And he concluded that you could have heart disease with either of those. It wasn't one or the other. The problem was he was a really good scientist. And the he was active when Eisenhower now goes and has, has his heart attack. And in fact, before him, Roosevelt, President Roosevelt dies of hypertension, a uh, stroke due to hypertension. And this is very embarrassing for the Americans because they didn't know how to treat hypertension. 
So they formed the National Institute of Health to particularly to address heart disease. And suddenly a whole lot of money came in. So the person who would be directing that money, you'd think would be Goffman because he was way ahead of anyone. But he, Ansel Keys knew that his future lay in grabbing that money and controlling it. And he happened to look at a diagram in a magazine one day, that's all, and it showed some sort of relationship between fat, dietary fat, sorry, the amount of fat eaten by populations and their risk of heart disease. And he selected six countries out of 22, draw a nice straight line through them, and there he said, you see, this is cause and effect. And he managed to convince the world, as happens still today, that you can take two variables and say the one causes the other. You can't say that it's associational data. The NIH then got behind him, and then the pharmaceutical industry got behind the theory, and that drove the idea that cholesterol causes heart disease. When they realized that, then they had to find a drug that would lower it. The Japanese had developed a fungus that can lower cholesterol, that, that those are the statins. The Japanese were on the verge of releasing it. The Americans realized this would be a multi-billion dollar industry. And so they made sure that they rapidly got hold of that, those products and started marketing them. And that, that's how they, they cornered the market. And then they, of course, cornered the doctors to by saying, well, it's obvious, cholesterol causes heart disease, low cholesterol, heart disease goes away. And Tony Gatto, who was head of the American Heart Association in the 2000 about said, before 2000, he said, fortunately, statins will make heart disease go away by the year 2010. That because the statins are going to be so successful. In fact, statins are utterly hopeless, and that hasn't happened. But unfortunately, the industry has captured the dietitians, and the industry has captured the cardiologists, it's captured the profession. So to get back to your long answer, yeah. the reason why I was targeted was I was threatening the industry, and the industry responded through the universities and had me expelled. And therefore, the university can't respond because they've laid down their, their marker that Noakes is a quack and what he's saying is wrong. And they've been told to say that. So they can't say it opposite, and they haven't. So in this country, we continue to promote the, the high carbohydrate, low fat, cereal based diet and as prevention of all, all diseases. Uh, the thing that kind of depressed me when you were speaking at the start, Tim, is you don't feel that you winning that trial and all the evidence that you adduced has changed minds. Because certainly in UK and US, uh, I'm sensing the beginnings of an avalanche of changing mindsets. You, you're not seeing it in South Africa. No, so Graham, I, 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 I need to correct the impression. What I said, academic medicine won't change. Academic medicine, but I quite agree with you. The, the, at, at other levels, the grassroots, there's big changes. And we are educating doctors, and the doctors are realizing that this has to... I've I got a lovely story this week that <laughs> an endocrinologist in Johannesburg, which is a thousand miles away from us, had repeatedly said, Noakes is a criminal, he should be in jail for promoting this diet. And so one of his patients uh, changed their diet. And so she came back to him and he noticed when he did the blood test that they'd all normalized. So he said, gosh, I'm so proud of you. Obviously, you're doing everything I told you and you're up to your medication. You looks like you're cured. And so she said, no, I'm actually taking no medicine. I'm just following Dr. Noakes' diet. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Did he fall off his chair? <laughs> he fell off his chair. And, <laughs> and you know what he said? Well, I think I better go and read up about it. We've only been writing about this since 2013. Uh, Seven years. Yeah. I've got a, a current example that's somewhat similar. One of my clients is slim, fair, attractive, very athletic, woman but she struggles she's at that menopausal point and she struggles with her weight and one of the things I always do I get all the biometric data from the GP so I know the, I know what the standard tests are that GPs can can um, ask for unfortunately there are very important tests that they're not allowed to ask for that's a whole other discussion but I've got used to interpolating sort of reading between the lines so I can read sufficient around the cholesterol profile and the liver function tests etc etc combined with the um, continual blood glucose monitor, glucose monitor to pretty much impute insulin resistance etc mm -hmm. 
So she, I looked at her tests over a period of time because I never look at a single test. And she'd gone from a really nice balanced uh, lipid profile with just the right relationship between HDL and Triggs. Um, and we'll probably, yeah. perhaps we can explain why that, that's important. And three, four months later, she, her cholesterol was lower and she'd reversed the ratio. So now she had less cholesterol, but an unhealthy relationship. And I said, what happened between A and B? And she'd been to see her GP, who'd looked at her cholesterol, ignored everything else, said, your cholesterol's high, you need to change your diet. And being the good patient that she did, is, she'd reversed her diet, changed it to a low-fat, high-carb uh, high carb diet. Her, yes, her cholesterol had come down, but of course she now had high levels of triglycerides and low levels of HDL. And I then had to spend a considerable amount of time with her without wanting to destroy her relationship or her confidence in the entire medical profession. What do I do? I said, well, just go back to your old diet. And that's where we are. And yeah. it's so frustrating, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. So as, a, as a postmenopausal woman, can I put my hand up? Sure. So frustrating. And I know we talked about this a couple of years ago when we sat down in Cape Town, Prof Noakes. I mean, we all are brainwashed about the low fat, uh, you know, and we, we live lives as women from the, our teenage years all the way, 20s, 30s, you know, this aesthetic ideal that is unachievable. And we are brainwashed and calorie deprivation. And then there's some other layer that comes along that you're trying to get to grips with, Graham, with your service, and that I'm still chasing because I don't have the same reward from the behaviors that I engage in, low carb, medium fat now, and, you know, trying to get as much exercise as possible. But I'm as chunky as ever. And so there's something impeding my progress. Have you done any more digging into that, Prof Noakes? Yeah, I think um, a lot of people put on weight on this diet. 10% of people actually put on weight on this diet that we, we did that, we have that evidence now. When the Banting craze hit Cape Town, we were getting reports on weight changes and, and about 10% put on weight. And it seems to me that some people eating a high fat diet is a problem and they need to up the protein. So Ted Naiman uh, from the US is the one who's talking about the PE ratio, yeah. the protein to energy ratio, and that most of the foods that we eat which are high in protein are also high in energy because they've got a lot of fat with them. And you need to look at the foods that are higher in protein but less have less fat with them. And so that's, that, that's the only thing I understand at the moment, that there are some people, for me, eating fat satiates me, and where eating protein doesn't. For other people, protein is highly satiating, and then that's fine. But if you aren't satiated with fat and you continue to eat fat, then that's a problem because all the fat in, in our body is stored directly from ingested fat. Or sorry, not most, all of it, most of it is. So the ingested fat is what's causing us to be, to collect the fat. It's under the influence of insulin and all that and the carbohydrates. But, but it, its, its origin ultimately is the dietary fat. So it makes sense to me that some people will benefit by eating a much higher protein diet and less fat. But they must be satiated. That's the key. Well, that's the funny thing with me, because as you know, I've been on, I've been doing relaxed keto, was strict at the very beginning, you know, 20 grams, and then it's sort of, you know, carb creep, it slid up to, to I suppose, 50, and, and I'll admit in lockdown, there have been days where it's gone to 100 as well, but, you know, you go through, you know, the just uh, peaks and valleys of all that, but I did watch your insulin resistance, your most recent CrossFit columns that you've put on YouTube, which are fantastic, with the Noakes Foundation and the Nutrition network and i also then that led me to the half hour presentation on insulin resistance where dr ted nyman was saying is it nyman yeah. or nayman nyman nayman i think nayman yeah. and he was he was he has some pretty uh, spiffy graphics there mm -hmm. and what was interesting to me is your adipose tissue once you've got this fat as a you know your estrogen all kinds of things your adipose tissue ends up making baby fat cells sometimes so you're really on a hiding to nowhere unless you manage to do you know some longer fasts to really empty those cells yeah i agree it's interesting because it conflicts with what we've been teaching and that's good you, we've got to work this one out it's we, the idea 
the original idea of the Banting diet was to increase the fat intake. And that would satiate you and you'd lose hunger and you'd eat fewer calories. But that clearly doesn't work for everyone. Although satiety, sorry to, to hog, the, no. hog the mic here, but the satiety factor is off the charts. I just mm. love this way of eating. You know, I can do a 30-hour fast, 36-hour fast. I'm not hungry. And that's only, it's not just the discipline of, of knowing how to control your hunger. Because you said in our original interview, you know, hunger makes you fat. And I just love that. It's so true. Yeah. Uh -huh. And a lot of people struggle with that statement. Yeah, that, that obesity is a disease of hunger. And uh, people don't understand it. You know, one thing I have learned uh, over the last perhaps year or two is that sugar addiction is such a driver and, and the industrial food diet. I think we actually were not absolutely correct when we said that cutting carbohydrates is the key. The key was cutting the processed foods because that's what we did. We processed foods went out of the window. And so, and then we said, well, it's all due to the reduced carbs. And for some of us, like myself, who are profoundly insulin resistant, cutting carbs is absolutely essential. But I think a lot of the benefit is getting rid of the sugar addiction. And conversely, in obesity programs and in studies of weight loss programs, if you're not addressing the sugar addiction, you can't expect the people on the low carb diet to do better than the other group because they're giving up sugar and that's addictive and they can't give it up. So they actually won't adopt the diet. And I think a lot of the negative studies suggesting the low carb diet isn't as effective as it might be is because you're studying groups of people addicted and there's no control for that sugar addiction and there's no effort to make them reverse that sugar addiction. Because, you know, I've watched people lose 80, 100 kilograms on this diet, but none of the clinical trials ever come close to weight losses like that. And it's because those people were motivated because they're Ill, they were seriously ill and they realized that they had to do something. So they were prepared to cut the sugar. But if you're on a clinical trial, why would you make yourself feel uncomfortable by cutting sugar if you have a sugar addiction? Tim, I'd just like to um, circle back to something that I think we rushed past it, which was your statement that uh, hunger makes you fat, um, which is something I talk about, but I'd like to hear your version of it because you'll elucidate it much better. Well, remember when I started and I said that what appealed to me, uh, what made me so angry about the new Atkins for the new year was a claim that you'd lose six pounds in six weeks without hunger. And it was the specific statement without hunger that made me angry. And then, of course, I now have researched it and I saw what Atkins, who developed the diet, he, he initially, uh, let's just get his story out the way. Mm -hmm. On the day that President John Kennedy was murdered in, in America, he was an overweight physician who was very unhappy with his life. And he was sitting there watching television and he said, listen, I've got to do something with my life. I've got to lose weight. I must become more athletic and healthy. And he said, I will not go on a diet that makes me hungry. And so he said, I'm going to go and find, go to the library and see what I can find out and what diets might prevent hunger. And he was on ketosis and he found that ketosis prevents hunger. So he said, okay, therefore I've got to find a diet that puts me into ketosis. And then he found some historic papers showing that a low carbohydrate diet will put you in ketosis. And so that's how he started. And again, his books all describe that will take away your hunger. So I think that, so what is the point? The point is that when, when we change and we eat a high carbohydrate diet, highly refined foods, we, that, in, that stimulates hunger and we eat more calories. And we start eating on the schedule every three hours. And what I tell people is if you want to understand the difference in the diets, eat your conventional grains for breakfast and the next day eat a typical English breakfast, lots of bacon and eggs and see when you get hungry. And people report we get hungry in the afternoon. I said, well, that's the answer. And you simply cannot control your weight if you're eating four or five times a day. You have to do, as Susan said, you have to be eating once or twice a day. And then it becomes it's so easy. Just another aside. We went and looked. A lot of people wrote to me and said, you know, your diet cured me of this, that, and the other. 
And about 28 people wrote and said, I, I got rid of my type 2 diabetes. And they were people in Cape Town. So we put them through a laboratory trial and we went and got their original data and proved that they had reversed their diabetes on the start. Some of them were still using medication, so they weren't, they'd reversed, but they weren't cured. But some had actually cured their condition. And there was only one thing that was important. They all said, sorry, the ones who were successful said, we lost our food cravings. We could now control what we ate. Yeah. If they didn't lose that, they didn't control their diabetes. So the control of diabetes is, is the control of cravings. It's not the control of blood glucose. That is a consequence of controlling your cravings. And you control your cravings by getting rid of the sugar and the, and the refined carbohydrates. Absolutely. I call it the tyranny of food. Yeah. And I feel, because for most of my life, you know, I was, I was a fat kid, I was a fat adult, I followed all the guidance. And yeah. the big, it feels like being let out of jail to me. I mean, I used to be starving for breakfast. As I was finishing breakfast, I would already be thinking about lunch, because yeah. breakfast really hadn't filled me up. And I'd eat a ton for lunch. And within half an hour, I'd be thinking about the next meal. And I was permanently hungry, snacking in between. And I had this unslakeable appetite. Um, so I'd be eating three big meals a day and snacking in between, getting yeah. fatter and fattier, storing more and more energy, and getting simultaneously hungrier and hungrier, none of which makes sense. <laughs> and now most days I eat one meal, at the weekends maybe two, and that hunger's gone completely, and I can just choose what I want to eat and when I want to eat, and it's just yeah. unbelievable, the difference. It's yeah. a revolution, absolutely. I concur, it's so liberating. Yeah. The other thing I'd like to return to, Tim, if we have time, is this whole area of the menopause. Because I've got a number of menopausal, um, postmenopausal, perimenopausal ladies, and, um, and, and they are um, doing all the right things, you know, they're calorie counting, they're exercising like crazy. One in particular, for a year, we calculated, you know, on a rough basis, and I know we don't believe in calorie counting, no, no. but for the calorie counting addicts, right looked out she's burning a thousand more calories a day than she's consuming yeah. she's done that for a year and lost absolutely nothing and i see this all the time where you modulate the diet and the the, the women are doing absolutely everything they're incredibly committed and because they're the cook and that changes the food in the house their partner who's never been on a diet and does really doesn't give a damn loses weight like there's no tomorrow right <laughs> with no effort and the woman's lost an ounce yeah um there is something about the menopause that produces some kind of fundamental change which i'm trying to my my task for this year is to try and get myself a better understanding of it do you have any greater understanding of what, what's happened that what this disaster is that 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 means that all well there's always a solution right i mean i'm sure you, I can always find the solution, but it's needle in the haystack stuff trying to find yeah. it. Yeah, so, the, you know, according to the calories in, calories out, you, you've destroyed that model. Yeah. And so that's the problem. So it's a, it's a paradox and it needs to be studied. But I must tell you that I worked with some athletes who, with anorexia nervosa. And these girls were running 100 kilometers a week and eating absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> And they were staying stable. It was. It didn't make sense. So there's, there is something going on that we don't understand. They, you must cut your metabolic rate to very, very little. One of my other students is now in Chicago. She published a really interesting paper, which is the reverse: that as you increase your energy expenditure, you, in exercise, you become less active during the rest of the day. And so your total energy expenditure doesn't go up. So you think if you run 100 kilometers a week or 200, it's 200, twice as much energy. No, no, no. The curve flattens out. So if you're running 200 or 100, it doesn't make any difference. You're burning the same amount of calories. So, so there's things that we just don't understand. And, and you know, in life, you just, you've got to make the observation and then someone has got to study it. But at the moment, you, you couldn't say that calories in and calories out doesn't work. It doesn't balance because they, no one is prepared to, to accept that information. But there, maybe there's a scientist watching this and who's prepared to go and do that. The problem with measuring these things, it's very difficult. We built a, a, a lab to measure metabolic rate, and we never really got it working properly. 
And I think there are about six in the world. So that that's part of the problem. Again, I could make this point that if you can measure something easily, then it's easy to solve the problem. Yeah. But what you're asking is it's not easy to measure the things that you want to measure. And therefore, it will go unanswered. I think you know that, you know, I developed this theory that the brain regulates exercise performance. And people said, but, but why had no one ever come up with it? Because the answer was it's difficult to study. But whereas measuring oxygen and glucose in the bloodstream and the rate of glucose turnover, that's easy. So the whole physiology of sport focuses on that and not on the brain because it's, it's too difficult to measure. And I think here again, the calories in, calories out, it's too difficult to measure. So we can't address those questions. But we must keep fighting and, and let's see, have, we, there must be someone who wants to make a PhD and win a Nobel Prize by solving this question. Well, if from we, I've been digging into this, you know, as you know, yeah. because you were you were talking about me just then, Graham. You know, having doing everything right, uh, managing to reverse my brainwashing about calorie deprivation. But um, you know, from what I understand as well, at menopause, I know this happened to me. You do have a cascade of turbulence that can affect your whole system when your sex hormones fall off that cliff. It can pause the thyroid. It, and if you're withholding calories, you can start you know, running on cortisol and adrenaline because, I mean, even now, I think you'll probably notice maybe clients and maybe you've observed this as well, Prof Noakes, you know, we are all steeped in, a, in anxiety. You know, we've almost got mid-trauma stress disorder. So the whole world at large with the COVID pandemic that's going on, we are steeped in cortisol. So it's going to be difficult with all of that hormonal turbulence to really be at our peak health. Yeah, you know, that's the beauty of... I, I had a long discussion this morning with a lady who won a prize from for the Nutrition Network. She lives in the Philippines. She has amazing stories. She developed type 2 diabetes. Well, she's not quite sure whether it's type 1 or type 2, but she's insulin dependent. And the moment she conceived, her insulin resistance worsened and she needed to increase her insulin. Now, at conception. So yeah. she said, I know I'm pregnant because my insulin requirement's gone up. Wow. And her insulin resistance was very bad during her pregnancy. She had to inject insulin. The moment the placenta was free, her blood glucose dropped out of the sky and she had to be put on a glucose drip for three days. And so what's going on? Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there are hormones obviously being released in some way from the placenta or may I, that's what I can only think of. And that was affecting her glucose regulation. So there is so much we don't understand and we kind of scrape the surface what we can measure, as I've indicated, and the stuff we can't measure. Yeah, it's so wonderful. I mean, this is such a, still, there are so many unanswered questions and gestational diabetes and what the baby needs and what the woman can get. It's, it's just fascinating to dig into these issues. And, and the, what the low carb group have done is to ask these questions and, and bring them to the front, whereas they were being hidden in standard medicine that, just, that it, they didn't matter at all. I think part of the problem is in medicine, we have this reductionist approach, you know, take this vitamin, take that tablet, and the, the, everything in human biology is so, however much you look at it, it's far more complicated than you ever think it was. And so the Absolutely. single approaches, are, it, it's almost like, you know, I, I wind people up who are golfers and I say, do you play golf with only one bat? And they say it's not a bat, it's a and I say that's my point, right? You've got nine different clubs. You'd never try and play a game of golf with one. And yet I think in medicine we're trying to do that all the time. One yeah. single reductionist approach. The latest one in the UK are these shakes. Hmm. Low calorie shakes. Yeah, the Nestle shakes, the Opti yeah. Fast or Opti Yogurt. Full of sugar, and full of seed oils. And yes, I guess you will lose some weight if high enough for long enough, but W only the health system would try and abstract food and turn food into something it never was. No. Why do we do that? And why do the scientists promote it? And there, you know, there's one or two scientists who are well known and well respected, and that they've just, yeah. it's a disgrace what they do. Yeah. Yeah, I get well, very frustrated. 
Yeah, ultimately, the, it's financial. That, so I, I promoted carbohydrates for 33 years, and we were rewarded for saying that. My research was funded by that. And eventually, it becomes like a drug. You have to have, where's the money coming for the next year's studies? And that, that's what happens. Yeah. That paradigm, I often talk about the tobacco industry. Mm. You know, follow the money, honey. And if you yeah. think about the huge paradigms of processed food and big pharma, it makes the um, economic might of the tobacco industry look like nothing. I think that's what we're up against. Exactly. Graham, yeah, I'm we're... wondering if you could um, bring up the role of healthy fats and, and maybe talk about the cholesterol con. <laughs> yeah, we've kind of, we've nailed most of the paradigms, haven't we? And this is the last one. Um, I, I think um, Tim really hinted at it earlier on with Ansel Keys. Um, and a lot of it originates from Ansel Keys, the American Heart Association, and Procter and & Gamble. And this whole interface between, I guess, two paradigms. One is these so-called heart-healthy vegetable oils, uh, AK seed oils. There's a story of the production of factory fats, which, uh, which go into processed foods. And then the other side of the story, I guess, is the statin industry. Um, I don't know if you want to take it from there, Tim. Yeah, so there never was any evidence for it. It was all based on this associational relationship. And then, then they developed the, the potential to make huge amounts of money through the statin industry. And, and in fact, my problem with my university started because I said statins don't work and cholesterol isn't the cause of heart disease. And that, was, and that you're not allowed to say. Just on, the, on the, the statins, they clearly don't do nothing. Well, they, they harm you. Effect. <laughs> they so, harm you. They do lower your cholesterol. Yeah. Uh, by preventing cholesterol entry or, or block cholesterol production in the cells. Yeah. So the cells have to import more cholesterol because they die if they don't have cholesterol. Yeah. So then your blood cholesterol does fall. But the the evidence that they work, they worked up till 2005. But then <laughs> the, the regulations changed and they said, no, but actually you can't hide the studies. If you do a study, you must report it. Yeah. And after 2005, the balance of evidence is that the drugs don't work. And they don't work in women. That's clear. That's the evidence is there. And even if they do work, they have, the benefit is one in, a thousand, one in a hundred people. So you have to treat a hundred people for one to benefit. Now, that's, that's ridiculous. When this diet will do much more for you because it will do the change of things that need to be changed. So the, the problem with it, so we have the two, uh, two theories. We mentioned that that Goffman had already desired, decided that there was a carbohydrate problem and that there was a fat problem in, in causing heart disease. And by 1965, the focus was definitely on carbohydrates. Carbohydrates were winning. And there were five articles published in the Annals of Internal Medicine in July 1965. And they all pointed to carbohydrates and sugar particularly as causing driving heart disease and arterial disease. And the Sugar Foundation in America was so threatened by this that they sent their vice president to Harvard. And he managed to get the two Harvard professors, nutrition professors, and he offered them a relatively small amount of money. It's about $50,000 in today's money. It, and he said, I want you to write something that will make sugar look good and fat look bad. And they did that and they published it in the New England Journal of Medicine in November 1967. And that was the end of the debate. The debate simply ends there. What next happens, the next key moment was that they started using these cholesterol lowering drugs. And the first drug that, that was effective, they had said, we must use a, a P, a, we must prove to a very high one in a hundred chance that this is true. Sorry, that the data must be so strong that they must, there must be a 99 out of 100 chance that they're correct. When the data didn't prove that, they, they loosened the requirements, the statistical requirements. And that paper was published in the Journal of American Medical Association with the statement that we finally solved the heart disease problem. We've got this drug, it lowers cholesterol. And they oversold that. And the next year, the American Heart Association and the National Institute of Health produced the guidelines for physicians because they knew the physicians weren't going to prescribe these drugs because they were reluctant. So they then were going to educate the physicians of America 
about the benefits of cholesterol lowering. And that program just came in before the statins arrived. The statin drugs arrived about a year later. Now the doctors have been primed. These drugs work. You must prescribe them. And that literally is the history that the, the evidence was absolutely infinitesimal that, this, that these drugs work or that cholesterol causes heart disease. But industry managed to convince the American Heart Association and the National Institute of Health. And from there, it was, it was gone. Because they, they, there was a group of groupthink cardiologists who ran the whole show. And they were the ones who were benefiting hugely from, from all the money that was coming into the system. Essentially, if you want to get the funding for your research, you've got to tow the uh, heart, heart, the cholesterol, heart, fat diet hypothesis. Otherwise, it's never get a voice. Sort of give a bit of perspective because some of this is very technical. We have various concepts in in the way that we use medication. One is numbers needed. In other words, how many people do I need to treat to get a benefit? And as you said, you need to treat about hundred people with a statin to get some kind of benefit. The other one is numbers needed to harm. In other words, if you treat those 100 people, how many people do you harm? And do the benefits outweigh the harms? And I would argue that in the case of statins, for the overwhelming majority of people, the harms outweigh the benefits. So that's one thing. The other thing is this concept of relative risk and absolute risk, which is very abstruse. But I'll try again and explain it in a very straightforward way. If my current risk of a heart attack is one, of, one in two million and I take a statin and it'll have a heart attack to one in a million, my absolute benefit risk, reduction in benefit is one in a million. But another way of portraying that is a 50% reduction in risk. So if I sell you a statin and say it's going to reduce your risk by a million, you'll say not interested. If I say it's going to reduce your risk by 50%, that sounds incredibly attractive. And so what we've got, a, what we have here is an industry selling drugs on the basis of, it doesn't talk about numbers needed to treat and numbers needed to harm, and it doesn't talk about absolute risk, it talks about relative risk. So you wrap up the statistics, was it Churchill who said lies, damn lies and statistics? And we've had the bastardization of these statistics to make the drugs look a lot more effective than they really are. And most primary care physicians are never going to go into the detail to understand it, unpick it and unwrap it. Yeah, now Lipitor is the classic example. So Lipitor is supposedly reduces your risk 33%. Yeah. If you go and look, if you open the package and you look at package insert in the United States, it says Lipitor has never been shown to reduce heart attack risk. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? <laughs> yeah. So you've got this whole statin industry on the one hand, and then you've got the um, processed food industry. And I always think there's a kind of an unwritten but unholy alliance between the two. Um, and as I often tweet, so processed foods makes you ill, and the uh, drugs industry improves things by 10%. Rinse and repeat. No, absolutely. Yeah, it's medicine. We, we don't benefit by making you healthy. That's the problem in medicine. And uh, you know, you've got to become a a patient and a customer to to benefit the industry. And this is why it's so fabulous the work that you're both doing, Graham, you at Pro Longevity and and Prof Noakes, uh, with the foundation that you set up in 2012. Talk about the work you do through the Noakes Foundation and your collaboration with the Nutrition Network, which is deep for a lot of health professionals. So when we wrote The Real Meal Revolution, which was the book that really got me into trouble because it said that this diet will reverse diabetes, and which I'm glad to say we now have proven correct. Uh, we made quite a lot of money and I, I never keep the money for myself. I've always had invested in other projects. And so we said, well, let's start the Noakes Foundation. And you know, my original goal was to do biochemical research, which is extremely expensive. And we, did, we raised sufficient money to do some really good studies. And I'm very proud of those, but they don't really, we don't really need more of them because we actually now know that the diet works and we know how it works and the biochemistry is fully described. So we realized that we've got limited resources. What really needs to change is we need to change the doctor's attitude because if we can educate one doctor, that doctor can have a massive influence amongst his patients or her patients and amongst the general public. 
So we decided to set up the nutrition network and that's a model of treating of training doctors around the world. And we have a series of, of world-class lecturers and it's gone extremely well. And we've, we've educated a couple of thousand doctors around the world onto the low carb story. And there's recognized certification for yes, this training, correct. isn't there? And it, it, correct. And in fact, last night, we're now going to the next phase where we're taking eight, we're giving them intensive six week program, and then they're going to get a full certification as a, a practicing low carb expert. So oh, it's gone, okay. it's really gone extremely well. Well, roll on that. Uh, no. That is that is really fantastic, and and again, you know, you're aided by the fact that all of this learning can be done by remote. You know, mm -hmm. the the advent of the World Wide Web, <laughs> and even the lockdown has probably helped because everybody's becoming a lot more savvy with tech. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's you know the role of universities is going to be in the future. Uh, Elon Musk, who's a South African, people may not know that. He said, uh, there's no reason to go to university because you can learn it all on the, on the web. It's all there. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm so amazed by the continuous learning that, that I'm finding online, you know, and just digging into all of it. And you think, oh, that's a fact. And even today, this morning, I was just reading an op-ed from Richard Horton, the editor of The Lancet, and he was, he was making the very real point that Graham and I recently made in one of our specials on how to survive COVID by strengthening your immune system and metabolic syndrome is one of us. And this is the, you know, the, the companion pandemic that is feeding the worst COVID outcomes. So, you know, I, I was, he was saying it's a syndemic. It's not a pandemic, and we need to start shifting public attention toward this controllable feature of it. You know, there's a there's, city has with collaborations of other South African groups has has published the first large study in South Africa of the predictors of fatal outcomes in COVID nineteen, and they would look particularly at tuberculosis and HIV. And you would think that if you have TB or HIV, your risk of dying from COVID would be increased. Yeah, there were two factors. There were only two factors that made a difference: age and type two diabetes. And type two diabetes increased your risk between eight and twelve fold. Yeah. That is absolutely massive. And you know the paper hardly mentions it; just ignores it because of the political paradigm that HIV and tuberculosis must be treated. I, I, that that what's frustrated me about COVID nineteen in a country like South Africa, which is resource poor, is that we just ignore diabetes. And two thousand five hundred people each week are diagnosed with type two diabetes in this country. Two thousand five hundred, and I know in Britain the deaths are, I'm, I forget if it's thousands a week from type two diabetes, but it it very likely is. It will if you think about the that. When I talk about diabetes, I think about the totality of cardiometabolic disease because all these diseases, in my view, are very much interlinked. What kills us? Hypertension, yeah. cardiovascular disease, diabetes, dementia, cancer, they're all linked. Yeah. So it's got to be, in a normal year in this country, there are, I think, 650,000 deaths. So it has to be the vast majority of those deaths. Yeah, no, exactly. And to focus on one condition and ignore the rest is just absolutely. It's absolute madness. It doesn't make sense. Public health is about the total package of all the diseases you have to address, not just the one. Yeah. And it all gets back to, you know, Hippocrates was on to something, food be thy medicine. It all gets back to the nutritional fundamentals that, that we've forgotten about. And it's not our fault because we live in this obesogenic environment and we're barraged by all of these, these messages. You know, no one has time. We're digging into it all and you guys have done stunning work. But it's, you know, it's confusing. Yeah, no, absolutely. And the industry planned it all. So Michael Moss's latest book is called Hooked, and he was the guy who wrote the book Salt, Fat, and Sugar. And it was about, I first read it probably eight years ago. He's an American writer, and I think he won a, a big award for that book. And he was talking then about how the industry had planned the obesity, or they, they didn't care that we were all going to get fat because they addicted us to their foods. So his latest book now is even more implicit about how this all happened. 
and how industry knew it was happening, but they had to choose between profits and health, and they chose profits. They weren't interested in people's health. Yeah, money always wins, doesn't it, Graham? I actually don't think so. I mean, despite the relative negatives we've talked about, if you go back and review you know, this from the start of our conversation. In the end, Tim won, he didn't lose. He set up this foundation. There's a growing worldwide movement of, of, of physicians, uh, patients, clinicians, and thinkers. And I think ultimately the science will win. So despite everything, I'm actually very optimistic about the future. I think we've, we've, we've established a network now of people who believe in a, in a better future, who have seen the light, who've experienced the light. And I always, as I always say, when I'm talking to uh, colleague professionals. Once you see the benefits of a low carb, healthy diet, it might be a bit more in protein, it might be a little bit more in this, you have to tweak it. Once you've seen it, you can't unsee it and you cannot go back to practicing the, it with the orthodoxy. It's impossible. No, I absolutely agree. I, hope, I don't want to sound pessimistic because I mean, we've come a long way. Yeah. I think what, what's pessimistic is that, that we can't be doing it more. Uh, let me tell you a little story. So. Having been kicked out of my university, or my wife says, you weren't kicked out, you retired. <laughs> so, well, <laughs> technically, I wasn't kicked out, but they kind of made, made sure I, I left as soon as I possibly could. I now get the chance to lecture the medical students uh, on how to read research. And of course, I stole in the low-carb story. And what, in lockdown, we had to give the lectures on Zoom. We couldn't go and talk to the students. And so I gave the lectures and then we asked five questions. And the fifth question is, what have you learned about nutrition, your personal nutrition from these lectures? And literally every medical student, so these 140 medical students who get no training in nutrition, yeah. said I've learned the critical role of nutrition in my yeah. health and in my patients. So they see it. And they, as, you say, as Graham said, they can't, they've seen it once, they're not going to forget it. The only problem in a country like South Africa where the majority of people are relatively poor and eating this diet, it's very difficult to change it. And that's why we have a third leg to our Noakes Foundation, and that's the Eat Better South Africa campaign, where we're actively studying how to allow people in impoverished communities to eat better, and they can eat better, and their health improves dramatically. And what do you recommend they eat? Well, it's, it's really simple foods. It's tinned fish, eggs, milk. And vegetables, by and large, they get really good quality vegetables. But the focus for the protein is from the eggs and the milk. And then some communities, because in South Africa, the, in the communities I serve, they can get hold of access quite a lot of good fish, so that that's the other one. But it's astonishing what you can do with tinned fish, eggs, and milk, and vegetables. Those become the core for the, for the diet. Yeah, and I, w I was reading on the Noakes Foundation website, you're feeding South Africans who are, as you say, um, among the poorest of the world on $3 a day, the equivalent yeah. of $3 a day. That's right. Which is great. But, and, and, you know, they, they, and then, then they learn to eat the fat, collect the fat. Where the fat's been cut off by the butchers, they go and collect that fat, and then they use that in place of butter and other things for cooking. So it can all be done. Yeah. But the remarkable thing is... How little interest there is in by government in, in changing this. Well, I guess that's the next thing. And I, you know, money will find a way though. I'm gonna to stick to that. Not that it'll always win, and it's wonderful to see that this grand awakening, this global grand awakening, and all the clinical experience that's that's coming from you know, the, the surgeries of general practitioners around the world. Um, you know, it is it is picking up momentum. And hopefully in our lifetimes, everything will change and people will start following the advice that you guys give. And I want to close with a little bit of fun because yeah. we, we all follow low carb, high fat, medium fat, you know, do time-restricted fasting. I hate to put those qualifiers, you know, intermittent fasting, time-restricted fasting, you know, because we have controlled our hunger with the way we're eating, good fats only, uh, keeping the carb sugar cycle uh, diminished, keeping it down. Um, if you had a superpower and you could just for one day have a blowout carb-rich meal, 
you know, never mind the consequences. We know the consequences are not good. What would you be? What What are the foods that you miss, um, Prof Noakes? You know, I'm going to disappoint you <laughs> because I don't miss any of them. <laughs> so... So if I put a, a vegetable laden and meat laden for you, um, pizza on a table near you, you would just think fat, sugar, insulin bounce. No, I wouldn't even think that. I think it tastes so disgusting. I wouldn't want to eat it. <laughs> what about you, Graham? Well, my, my sneaky addiction is Kentucky Fried, Kentucky Fried Chicken. As you know, I'm Jewish and uh, chicken is an absolute fundamental sta staple of any Jewish diet. Um, and of course, Kentucky Fried's got to be relatively healthy, isn't it? Because it's based in chicken. What could possibly go wrong? The fact that the chickens are, you know, produced in some kind of farm and fed shit instead of food, never see the light of day. They're probably in terribly poor condition when before they're slaughtered. And then, of course, they're deep fried in oxidized seed oils which is carcinogenic and a metabolic toxin and then you have but anyway my my, my guilty pleasure would probably be to start the day with um a, um, a family uh, pizza for two because uh, one never satisfies me um i reckon by about 11 o'clock i'll be starving so i'll have a, a sack full of doritos um because like i love doritos and i can never get enough and they're never satiating and then i would have a family bucket in the evening of kentucky fried and that would be my perfect day. And the next day and the day after and the day after, I would feel so shit. There's no words for it. <laughs> Absolutely. So, Susan, I know that I, you can, I can see you looking at me and saying, I know this is not being truthful here, but honestly. <laughs> no, but I'm not. You know, I was with you. We sat in the cafe for, what, hours? Because yeah. we did the podcast, a couple of shows for, okay. for my podcast, The Big Middle. And we sat in under the umbrellas and in the sun. And we talked for quite a long while. And we both just had coffee and water. Yeah, Everyone yeah. else was tucking into carb loads. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, lit I think what's happened, I've reprogrammed my brain. Yeah. And so if I see something that is sweet, I, I, it just, I just don't want to know about it. It's such a powerful motivated that i don't want it it's going to taste bad even if it tastes good it used to taste good you know i used to eat pringles chips for example and always feel sick but now i remember the sickness not the the taste before that and so i think that's the difference so, yeah I, i'm for you know the one thing i've never drunk alcohol because i would immediately feel sick as soon as i drank alcohol and i think i finally got to that stage with cereals i i wouldn't eat them because they make me feel sick so quickly yeah. yeah. Well, let's raise a, a, a glass, a big one to you, non-alcoholic glass of something fizzy. And thank you so much, Prof. Tim Noakes, for coming on the first episode of Pro Longevity, the podcast. Well, thanks again, Susan. And I wish you and Graham great success in your program. I'm so glad that Graham believes we're going to change the world because I think he's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's, all, it's all in attitude, isn't it? So, yes, we all need to adopt that, especially me. I think so many years in the news, I'm such a cynic. But anyway, Prof. Tim Noakes, esteemed sports scientist, controversial, we still have to call you controversial campaigner for eating low-carb, high-fat, because you still get a lot of stick, and, and a world resource. Um, we can't mention that often enough. I think it deserves a second mention, because yeah. Graham and I, we are agreed. Uh, you are a world resource, and I have learned so much much from you and I, I really can't thank you enough. Well, thank you both and it's been a great privilege and I really enjoyed the last hour together. Thank you so much and best wishes for 2021 and let's hope it's a great year and we make even greater progress in our joint, our desire to change the world. Yeah. Here, here, cheers, cheers. Um, head to prolongevity.co.uk for a bounty of information from Graham and his team. And um, we'll put in the show notes a lot of links to um, all of the fabulous work that Prof Noakes does as well. And also, Graham, you've got a Facebook group, don't, don't you, that, that's quite Facebook. interactive. Yep. Yeah, um, we do quite a few Facebook live events. It's very, you know, it's quite a dynamic, interactive group. Just search for Wellness with Prolongevity. There's a ton of free resource. You can contact me from there. You can chat to other people. We're trying to build a community um, that can support each other and explore the future. So, and that's been, a, you know, a, a great success for us as well. So the two things work very well together, the website and the Facebook group. Synergy, that's what we like. So you're all set now to maximize your health. You've got 
No excuses, all the resources at your fingertips. And with this podcast, it is shiny, brand new. And really, we thank you so much for spreading the news. Subscribe. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button. That really helps. And if you don't mind, if you're going to Apple Podcasts, which is still the most popular way of listening to podcasts, rate this new Pro Longevity podcast, review it, give us a nice chunky review. And uh, yeah, and then we can get it in more ears and share it with your family and friends. And also, I do want to say that this, we need to have a little bit of a pro forma disclaimer here. Please consider what you have heard in this episode as information. You know, it's it's not to be construed as medical advice. It's just all the end goal is to educate you and put the information out there so you can make your own choices about everything. So if you really have a deep dive question with your health, go to your general practitioner and and weigh everything you hear against what they tell you as well. So that's it. Stay well. Bye-bye. Bye, Prof Noakes. Bye-bye. And thanks again. Thanks for a lovely, lovely interview. Bye, Bye Graham. See you. Bye, Susan. And thanks for everything. Bye now. Thanks for listening. And please do share and subscribe to all our podcasts to hear more about Graham and his many years of success in helping people to rapidly overcome life-threatening and debilitating conditions with simple, drug-free lifestyle changes. Visit www.prolongevity.co.uk or join our Facebook and LinkedIn groups. There you'll find daily updates and tips on the science and safe, scientifically proven ways to reduce the risk of serious ill health from common killer diseases such as type 2 diabetes, coronary heart disease and cancers.